Welcome back to Squawk Box. Our next guest is an organizational psychologist who uh, challenges the conventional wisdom on the best ways for people to learn, work, and succeed. Want to bring in best-selling author Adam Grant. He, of course, is a professor at UPenn's Warden School. He's the host of the podcast, Rethinking, and he has a new book out uh, just released this week. It is titled Hidden Potential, The Science of Achieving Greater Things. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, before we get into the book, I'm hoping you can help us with this. We've been dealing with this terrible situation in the Middle East and a crisis, and a crisis of trying to get people to talk to each other. And I feel like as an organizational psychologist who's dealt with behavioral and sort of uh, the, the behavioral management issues and just how people, uh, what, is there any lesson you think in all of the work you've done, maybe not just in this book, but in, in sort of where we are for people to think about all this? I wish I had an easy answer to that question, Andrew. I don't. Um, I think, like a lot of people, I've been horrified um, on many levels. I think the, probably the thing that's been most striking to me is um, just the sheer exhaustion that people are feeling from having to argue. Right. And um, psychologists talk about empathic distress, which is the feeling of burning out from caring about other people, but feeling unable to help. And I think we ought to be spending less time bullying people about what they should say online and trying to figure out what we can do offline in real life. And I mean, you've been dealing with, by the way, at the University of Pennsylvania, that's one of the reasons I was thinking about this, um, in terms of just trying to get people to, to, to come together and actually talk to each other. But as it relates to this book, Hidden Potential, uh, underneath the title of the book is this very idea that we all have some kind of potential that we don't know about or that we know about but needs to be somehow unearthed. And the real question I would ask is, some people have it, and it seems like it's very obvious uh, when they have it. Sometimes you meet somebody and you say, they're special. There's something very special about that person. But the book suggests that, that there's something special about all of us, and I think we all want to believe that. And the question is, how do you think is the best way to unearth that, especially in those who are still trying to find that sort of passion? Well, I think the, the place I want to start is to say natural talent is overrated. Um, it's really easy to admire prodigies, but most child prodigies do not grow up to become adult geniuses. And I think that leads us to, to really underestimate the slow learners, the late bloomers. And if we want to start unearthing that potential, the, the place I want to begin is to say there's an incredible study uh, that Raj Chetty, an economist, led, where he looked at, um, at predicting people's career success in their 20s and found that you could actually predict income from knowing how many years of experience your kindergarten teacher had. What? Yeah, this is, I mean, shocking. How could this be? Well, it turns out if you had a more experienced kindergarten teachers, uh, teacher, they don't give you a big edge in reading or math over time. What they do is they teach you character skills. Hmm. Um, they teach you discipline and determination, and you learn how to be pro-social and proactive, and you carry those skills with you, and I think we need to spend more time on character skills. Do well, you remember your kindergarten teacher's name? I remember my first grade, Mrs. Mike. No, I remember my first grade. I've got to, I so I guess she was first grade. I remember. She was so pretty good. Pretty work for you. Yeah. Um, one of the things you have thought a lot about is hiring, how to hire people and how to find people yeah. in terms of uh, their hidden potential. That oftentimes that when you're hiring somebody, if you, you don't necessarily see it in the interview, how you try to extract that. Mm -hmm. Well, my, my favorite practice is to think a little bit about the trajectory of people's performance over time. So a lot, of, a lot of organizations use GPA, and they think, OK, if, you know, if you've got great grades in school, that means you're smart and you're a hard worker. Mm -hmm. What we know is, actually, a grade point average is much less useful than grade point trajectory, which is the question of, did your grades improve over time? If they did, it's usually a signal that you faced some kind of adversity and you figured out how to overcome it. And I think we ought to pay more attention to From those candidates. From a B candidates. to a C, come on. I mean, I guess that would be the least attractive <laughs> well, even, option, well, maybe, I don't you know. Had, if your grades dropped at some point and then came back, that, that explains maybe you had to find out what happened along that, that, that path line. But Malcolm Gladwell wrote about this, too. I think he, he, he did this whole thing on how the NHL players in Canada mm -hmm. All were born in like January, December, or February because they decide at age five who's good and who's not. You know, and that, that, that you go through the leagues that way the whole way through. But what you're saying about how there are late bloomers, there are later developers, and we get it wrong sometimes because we focus all our efforts on who we decide is good when they're five or six or seven years old. You know, Becky, there's an interesting twist on those hockey data. It yeah. turns out that it is true that if you were born earlier in the year, you're more likely to make it. But the, the later births that actually do make it end up becoming more successful on average. 
And in part, it seems to be the case that they had to be that much better, and they also faced deeper competition. Right, because right, when you're looking at a group of five-year-olds, the ones who are six months older have a huge advantage yeah, over right. the ones who are six months younger. Um, but that's, that's an excellent point, too, getting into just adversity and finding that. What are other ways that if you're a recruiter or you're somebody looking for talent that you can find people who have overcome adversity? There's an incredible call center in Israel called Call Yachol. Um, they hire people with disabilities and underdogs. And one of the things they do is they ask you at the end of the interview, how do you think that went? And then if you're not happy with it, they give you a do-over. And it's a chance to, to see, are you motivated and able to learn? Uh, and I, I would love to see every organization on the planet give people a second shot at an interview. Have you done that before? I have. And how does it, but how does it work out? I mean, do most people say, I want the second shot, give, I want to redo it? And if they say they don't, does that mean you disqualify them because they're not trying? Or what's no, the... no, I, I, it's fine if, if you think it went well that you don't ask for a second shot. But in my experience, about a third of the candidates will, will want to do it again. And it's a great opportunity to see you know, what, what do they take away from what didn't go perfectly the first time and then are they focused on improving? If you asked me how I thought an interview went at the end of it, I'd, I'd immediately have self-doubt and think, what? <laughs> you, clearly you think something was wrong. What if I ask every candidate? Are you still going to feel that way? I don't know. Maybe I need to tell you that, hey, I love to give everybody right. a shot at this. Can I ask you a, a different question, which has to do with, again, it's sort of the hidden potential issue, but it's also how somebody, maybe a job applicant, projects themselves in the context of one of these, these interviews. Because the truth is, everybody wants to appear to have a sense of humility, but at the same time, you want them to have a sense of confidence, and how folks should talk about themselves in front of other people. Oh, yeah. So I actually studied this a few years ago with Allison for Gale, and we found that people get away with self-promotion uh, when, uh, when the person's not paying attention. So if the interviewer is not fully focused, uh, singing your own praises can work. If they are, it might backfire. I think there are ways, though, to signal both confidence and humility. Um, I, I met a woman years ago who applied for a job she was not qualified for, and she wrote this amazing cover letter and said, I am not the candidate you're looking for. I don't have these years of experience. I don't have these skills. What I do have, though, is a, t a determination to learn. And if you hire me, I'll prove that I'm worth it. And I love the way that she said, look, I'm, I'm not quite the fit, but I'm going to grow into this role. And I think that's a message we could probably communicate more often. Hire? Yeah, she got the job, and she crushed it. <laughs> when you began this project, this book project, and you've written now a number of big bestsellers, what was the thing you were looking to do and, and, and trying to learn? Was there something that in the process of writing this book that you unearthed yourself? Yeah, I think one of my biggest frustrations in my career has been um, I've had a hard time getting feedback from people, useful feedback in particular. Um, when I started doing a lot of public speaking, I would ask, what, 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 can, I, what can I learn? Um, tell me, tell me what's your, what are your notes? Give me some feedback. And I basically heard from cheerleaders and critics. There were cheerleaders who were applauding my best self and saying, that was great, which is useless to me. Uh, there were critics who were attacking my worst self and telling me what was terrible, and that was demoralizing. And one of the things I learned while writing this book is that instead of asking for feedback, it's more effective to ask for advice. Instead of asking, uh, how did that go, I should have been asking, what can I do better next time, which focuses people on being constructive in the future. And instead of criticizing or cheerleading, they end up being coaches. They see my potential and then hopefully help me become a better version of myself. Adam Grant, the book is called Hidden Potential. Congratulations. Thank you. We've all got some, hopefully. <laughs> thank you. And this book's got a lot, so thank you.